Thank you so much, everyone, for attending our fifth in the series uh, called Critical Conversation. Um, for those that have attended previous presentations, you know by now that Critical Conversations was created as a way to bring in outside speakers to talk about important subjects that spark critical conversations within our own community. So uh, without further ado, um, I'm very excited to announce our next speaker, LaDonna. Uh, LaDonna is the editorial director at Dropbox and she is giving her presentation today on permission to speak. In her, doc, in her talk, LaDonna will talk about lessons learned during her two years of brand building and also her own personal journey from silence to conferences everywhere and then uh, how she uses uh, those lessons and turns them into tools that all of us can use to unlock the power of our own personal voices. So uh, just one last housekeeping note before we get started. Um, if you, everyone could hold off on their questions till the end of her presentation, that would be great. Um, and she will let the audience know uh, when the Q&A is opened up and you should feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question and or feel free to enter them into the chat. Uh, Lisa and I will be uh, monitoring the chat and getting the questions to LaDonna. So with that, uh, LaDonna, I'm so excited for this. Thank you so much for being with us today and uh, feel free to take it away. So hello everyone, I'm coming to you live from my basement in San Francisco. Um, I have a dog laying on the floor quietly farting next to me and I'm really glad you can't smell it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> such is the, the Zoom life now. Um, so I have been a writer for my um, entire career. I started as a journalist and then moved into copywriting and now I'm in tech. Um, working in the editorial side at Dropbox. And over the course of my career, which has been about um, two decades now, I have really come to believe in the power of stories. I find that more than facts or force or the most well-reasoned arguments, the stories that we tell one another are really the key to changing people's minds and therefore the very world itself. And the best and most powerful stories really require something personal of the storyteller because when you're brave enough to be vulnerable and offer up some naked pink part of yourself, then your story resonates with those who hear you on a profoundly human level. But many of these life altering world changing stories remain unheard because the people who could tell them believe they do not have permission to speak. They believe their voices are unwelcome that no one wants to hear what they have to say. And I used to be one of those people. And honestly, sometimes I still am, because this is a process. I do not have it all figured out. But today I am giving myself permission to get personal and to tell you some truths about who I am, not so much about my professional identity, but something about LaDonna, the human person, because I want you to see the way in which reaching down into to the core of who you are changes the stories that you tell. So I'm gonna start with a photo of myself when I was small because my mom would always tell her friends that I was a strong-willed child and that was not a compliment. And then when I was 15, the principal of my high school called me a witch because he thought I had the makings of a rebel, even though I had obviously self-curled my hair by twisting it. So that's what all the rebels do, I guess. Um, and then not so long ago at work, I was voted most likely to say fuck in front of an executive, and I did. So based on that very short resume, you might think that I'm quite comfortable speaking my mind, but you would be wrong because I grew up here in the middle of the United States in Illinois in a small farming town where everyone voted Republican, ate a lot of sweet corn, went to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And church had a lot to say about what I could and couldn't say and do and wear and think. It was a fundamentalist world. And in that world, women were submissive and silent. They could play the piano at church, but they couldn't stand in the pulpit. They were taught to be keepers at home, subservient to their husbands and were quite literally not allowed to wear the pants. So these are my parents. And as you might guess from this photo, they're really sweet. They're 
wonderful people. I had a good childhood. They loved me well. But my dad made it very clear to me that as my father, it was his job to protect me and watch over me until I grew up and got married, at which point he would hand that job right over to my husband, who would then take over the whole protecting me and watching over me. He wanted to make sure I had a good life, but in his worldview, the man was the head of the household. So that meant that my mother, who was a strong woman in her own right, deferred to him in decision making. So when I became a teenager and I wanted to go on a date with a boy, my dad had to meet that boy, interview him and approve of him. And as you can imagine, there weren't very many teenage boys who were willing to take him up on that offer. So when I moved away from home and went to university, my world really began to open up as it does for many of us. I hung out with people who didn't look or act or think like me. I shared some of my story with them and they shared theirs with me. And so I began to really peel away my childhood skin and strip off the narrow ways of thinking that no longer made sense. And as I entered into adulthood and left the religion of my parents behind, I thought I had discarded the system of patriarchy as well. But I was incredibly naive because even now as a 40 mumble year old woman, I'm still learning all the ways in which these lessons of silence and submission are buried really deeply within me. When you're taught these things from a young age and when they're reinforced over and over by the people you love and look up to, they're incredibly difficult to root out. They just really become a part of who you are. So about a year ago, I was wrestling with a really difficult situation in my career. It was keeping me up at night and I was really anxious. So I thought this picture of a horned cucumber in a gate was appropriate to illustrate my state of mind. And during that time, another woman challenged me to stand up for myself and to use my voice in a new way to be stronger and louder even though I thought I already was strong and loud. Her exact words to me were, you have more power than you know. And for me, those words were like a stone dropped in a pond because the ripples just kept spreading and spreading as I thought about it. It started with this particular situation in my career, but then I began to see this really disturbing pattern throughout my entire life. I began to see all the ways in which I was waiting for someone in a position of power, and usually that person would be a man, to give me permission to do something. So in spite of all my strength and skill and sass and experience, I was waiting for permission. And many times I was doing this without even realizing that that's what was happening. So, you know, your story is different than mine, but I'm thinking that you might recognize some of these feelings. Because no matter where you grew up or what your religion or lack thereof might be, no matter how free spirited or repressed your childhood might have been, you also have been told over and over again what is the acceptable standard of existing in our society. So you might think like I did that you've, you know, you're educated, you're having a great career, you've rebelled against that old way of thinking and being only to discover that you're still subconsciously following those old rules. Many of us, especially women, but really anyone who's ever been marginalized, anyone who doesn't look or sound or act like the people in power, we've been trained from a young age to sit quietly and raise our hands. So I'm thinking there are probably some of you here today who are thinking, but well, that's not me. I've never felt like I needed permission to do anything, especially to use my voice. I just say whatever I want, whenever I want. And I see you, you magical unicorns, and I'm asking you not to turn off and tune out because you yourself might not need permission to speak, but you do need to realize that not everyone around you feels the way that you do. Not everyone has the power and privilege that you enjoy. So what I'm asking of you today is to hear the voices that are not like your own, and to think of ways that you might in your own work and life make space for other people who are not like you so that you can lift up their voices. Because for those of us who've been conditioned all our lives to take a seat and shut our mouths, we find ourselves doubting our right to be heard. We believe that our stories maybe don't matter. So the idea of whose voice is acceptable is actually built right into the way we use the English language. You look at this word, chairman, 
And then you've got congressman, fireman. When we're referring to all of humanity, what do we say? Mankind. We talk about manpower and man-made lakes and, oh man, where did I leave my keys? And then there's the one that I am the most guilty of all the time, you guys, no matter who is in the group. So in an essay called Why Sexist Language Matters, sociology professor Cheryl Kleinman notes that linguists have this term called symbolic annihilation. It refers to the disappearance of women into male-based terms, meaning that by favoring terms like you guys, we make women a subset of men. She goes on to ask if we as women aren't worthy of true generics like first year instead of freshman, chair instead of chairman, or you all instead of you guys, then how can we expect to be paid a man's wage or be respected as people rather than objects and be treated as equals? But on the other hand, if you're taught from birth that you're entitled to power and a platform just because of the body and skin that you're born into, then you will act accordingly. You will believe that, of course, all this was meant to be yours, like believing you should run for president of the United States because, man, I'm just born to be in it. So all of this reminds me of this statistic that I came across a few years ago, that men apply for a job when they meet only 60% of the qualifications, but women wait until they meet 100% to apply. Another way of looking at how the system works is this. In the 2018 Harvard Business Review, they analyzed 81,000 performance reviews to study words used to describe men versus words used to describe women. And men who receive negative performance reviews are penalized with just two adjectives, arrogant and irresponsible. While women were inept, selfish, frivolous, passive, scattered, opportunistic, gossipy, excitable, vain, panicky, temperamental, and indecisive. The way we use language in our culture to talk about women has a profound effect. Girls get the message from a very early age that their voices are not welcome. And as we grow up, we see that if we do speak up, we should get prepared to be called some names like pushy, bossy, feisty, hysterical, difficult, and my favorite, shrill. So, I've just been talking a lot about women because I am one, but I know that women are not the only ones who get the message that our voices aren't welcome. If you look at any society anywhere around the world, there are people who have power and the people who don't, the people who get squashed and the people who do the squashing. And in every one of those societies, the voices that are loudest and most numerous are those of the people in power because your voice is your power. If you take away someone's voice or you convince them that their voice doesn't matter, so they just go ahead and silence themselves for you, then you effectively make that person invisible. And if you can make an entire group of people invisible, you can do with them whatever you want. You can deny them civil rights, pay them less money for the same amount of work, discredit them, harass them, conquer them. I mean, we've all seen evidence of this throughout history over and over again. In 1975, two cultural anthropologists, Edwin and Shirley Ardener, came up with the muted group theory. The whole idea is that the dominant group, the people in power, are in charge of society's communication system, the social norms and vocabulary. So in order to speak up and be heard, marginalized groups have to learn to use the dominant group system in order to express themselves. But it's difficult for them to articulate their ideas and make themselves heard because they have to go through this whole translation process. They don't have the power, so they're not as free to say what they wish, which continues to keep them from having power. Here's an example and a photo of my daughter a couple years ago at the San Francisco Dyke March. In many societies, LGBTQ groups are considered marginalized, right? Straight people are the norm, we're dominant, and since straight people control the discourse they can and have ignore anyone who's not like them. The message that heterosexuality is acceptable standard and everything else is an aberration is a powerful one and it's one that's locked people in closets for years and for lifetimes. It's the reason why in this country nearly 42 percent of non-binary youth have tried to kill themselves at least once in their lives. And it's the reason why all around the world, lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, transgender, intersex, and queer people are harassed in the streets, beaten, imprisoned, and killed simply because of who they are. 
So before they can even begin to fight for equality, they have to first fight to make their voice heard at all. Muted group theory applies to issues of race, of aging, of disability as well. And you can see evidence of the silencing everywhere in our society, in politics and education, and absolutely in the workplace. So it's really popular these days to talk about inclusive, inclusivity and the beauty of diversity. At Dropbox, we even have this really lofty sounding mission to design a more enlightened way of working. And when I think about that, and I imagine a more enlightened way of working, I think that opening the door to diverse perspectives sounds like a really good way to start. And in fact, decades of research by organizational scientists, psychologists, sociologists, economics, and demographers shows that when you have a socially diverse group, it's more innovative than a homogenous group, that diversity enhances creativity and leads to better decision making and problem solving, which is all wonderful, but simply tooting the horn for diversity isn't enough when there are so many people among us who don't feel entitled to raise their voices. We need to create the conditions for inclusivity and to listen to more than one voice and hear more than one story. In a TED talk called The Danger of a Single Story, Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie speaks about how she came to the US at age 19 to go to university. And her roommate who was American was shocked that she knew how to speak English and use a stove and that her favorite music was Mariah Carey. And as she said in her talk, that's because her roommate had been told one story of Africa as a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people, fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. We define our culture by the stories we tell each other. So when we silence others and we refuse to listen, then our stories become homogenous and redundant. We don't consider new perspectives, only one small corner of the whole picture. And by doing so, we all miss out. So I love the quote, this quote also from Chimamanda that the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make the one story the only story. And when I think about stereotypes, it, you know, a whole bunch come to mind immediately. Women are bad drivers, right? Canadians apologize too much. Irish people drink a lot tech bros are ruining San Francisco. And then you think of all the other stories that we don't hear when we narrow it down to just one note instead of the entire symphony. And think about the truth of human experience that's lost to us when we do that, and the varied and complex voices that remain unheard. But I, what I'm here to talk about today is breaking that silence and adding your voice to the larger melody because you can refuse to go quietly. You can lift up your voice and tell your story. But to get there, you're gonna need to be honest about who you are and do some maybe serious introspection. Obviously, this sort of environment isn't the great, the most ideal time or place for that. So I'm gonna give you a quick guide that you can use to dig down and unearth your voice when you have more time and privacy. And also I wanna let you know that um, what I'm going to talk about now is available also in a personal workbook called the Personal Voice Guide. And it's available by a downloadable PDF and also in a really gorgeous printed book that comes with a kit. Um, and you'll get an email of follow up after this talk that you can access either or both of those if you like. It's a great way to kind of be able to spend more time with this and think about it a little bit more. But this is the first question that I want you to ask yourself today. Who am I really? Because all of us, before we're writers or designers or scientists or communicators or whatever your answer is at parties when people say, what do you do? Back when we all used to go to parties, um, we're human beings, first of all, right? We have hurts and histories and loves and fears. We're full of passions and flaws and all kinds of things that we don't feature on our social media bios. 
But these imperfections that we instinctively try to hide, our failures, our mistakes, our weaknesses, our obsessions, these are actually the things that really connect us to other people. In fact, if you think about the art you really love, the, the music, the books, the movies, the very reasons you love them are not necessarily because they're perfect, but because they make you feel less alone. They connect with something in you that makes you feel like you're not the only oddity in the universe. So when I ask you to think about who you are, I'm not talking about a glossy facade. I'm not talking about what we do um, at work or on social media to carefully construct a persona. I'm talking about who you really are. I like to think about David Bowie. So be like Bowie, right? Do what you like. Your voice, your story, the thing that you hold dear doesn't have to be the shiny thing that everybody else is talking about. It doesn't have to be the story your family wants you to tell or the path that your peers expect you to take. So I am hoping that you will listen to yourself with care and openness and curiosity and compassion and figure out what's really going on in there right now. And don't be afraid to get weird. If weird is your thing, get weird. Some of you might already know what your thing is. You have a story already burning a hole in your pocket. You know how you want to use your voice, but some of you might not be so sure. And that's where a self audit could help. This involves some of that quiet introspection so you can ask yourself some questions and think about it. Um, and this is also included in the workbook that I mentioned. So I'm going to use my self audit as an example of what I'm talking about. Um, and then I will tell you how I got there. Okay, so I'm a woman, I'm white, I'm straight, I'm a Scorpio. Oh, I'm also an American and then I'm a Scorpio. I'm an introvert, I'm tall, I'm curvy, I'm a misanthrope, I'm a mother to a daughter, I'm married to a man, I'm a writer, I love to travel, I love to read, I love animals, I love to do lists. I'm really angry about the rise of white supremacy in my country, and I'm really scared about climate change. I'm really hopeful that we're not all living in a horror show, but who knows? I want to use my voice to make a difference in the world. I also really want to move to Portugal. I want to speak more than one language. I want to be more patient. I want to write more poems. So here's how I got there. I ask myself, these questions. What did I inherit? So what did you inherit? The things about yourself that you did not get to choose, where you were born, who your family is, the gender you were assigned at birth, things that you are without any choice. And then ask yourself, what did I choose? What are the things that I made happen? The parts of my identity that I chose for myself, where you live now, your career, etc. Also, what brings you really deep joy? And what are your vices? What are you really good at? What makes you angry? What lights you up inside? What are you afraid of? And what breaks your heart most about this world? What lights a fire in your belly? And what do you wanna change? And again, all these questions are in the workbook. I know I'm going through them kind of quickly, but the point of this self audit is to get to your values, which is the second thing I wanna talk about. Not everything in the portrait you'll create of yourself is of equal importance, right? You, there's a lot of questions to answer. You're gonna have a big list of things, but when you look at it, there are going to be certain things that really stand out. So for me, I mentioned that I'm tall and curvy, but I don't feel any particular need to go on Zoom to another company and give a talk about how I'm tall and curvy. That's not what I'm passionate about. So the things that you value are going to be outlined in neon in your head when you look at it. They will be things that you care about really deeply, but also things that you have experience in. So when you speak about them, you, you already have credibility. Also, I want you to remember what we talked about earlier, that your voice is your power and it's most powerful when it's honest, not when you're saying what you think other people want, want to hear or even need to hear. 
So I encourage you to get real and speak from the core of who you are about what is really in your heart of hearts. So how do you know that you're getting real? That's easy to say, get real, but how do you know that this is really real and this isn't, this voice in your head is actually coming from you and not from your family or your friends or your fears? First of all, it won't go away. It will be something that you keep coming back to over and over again. It will feel really right. You can just feel it in your bones. This is good. This is meant to be. It also just makes sense. So if you talk to the people who know you best about whatever this thing is that you want to use your voice to do, they'll be like, yeah, that, that sounds like you. And it doesn't hurt in a bad way. It might hurt in a good way because it's going to require some work. But if it's damaging or draining or demeaning, that's not you. Also, it lights you up. It gives you energy. You're really passionate about it. When you talk about it, you're gesturing wildly. So if you have this thing that you care about really deeply, what is stopping you from using your voice to talk about it? What is silencing you? This is where some more deep thoughts and honest inventory come into play. And I'm going to ask you some questions that might be kind of tough. Where in your life do you feel silenced? Where are you unable to express who you are and what you care about? When was the last time that you truly felt heard? Like someone not just listened to you, but they got it, they heard you. When did you find yourself in a situation where you really wanted to say something, but you didn't? You silenced yourself. And what do you want to say that you're not saying? You can feel it right there, but you just keep swallowing it down. Maybe you're worried that someone else has already said it better than you. And so there's no need for you to add your voice. When I was originally writing this talk a year ago, another woman at Dropbox gave a talk about women in tech speaking up and using their authentic voices. And my very first thought when I heard her speak was not, oh, good for her. It was, oh shit, she's talking about this. So I might as well just stop writing my talk because she's doing a great job. Nobody needs to hear from me, which is why I love this quote. We're so lucky that flowers don't hold themselves back because other flowers are already blooming. And Emily McDowell, who's a writer and illustrator, also said, someone else is already talking about that is a killer. It only serves to deny the world the beauty of your voice. It's true. Someone else will always be doing it and doing it beautifully, but that does not diminish the value of your own story. So maybe you do the self audit and you ask yourself these questions about how you're being silenced and you feel you've been telling the same story for a long time, but it's not accurate anymore. You want to evolve and tell a different story. And I think that's something we all have to do over and over again, right? Who I was at 22 is not who I was at 32, is not who I am at 42 or older. Our identities are not carved in stone. I think that if living, if we're doing it right, changes us. Someday we'll be able to travel again and go to foreign lands and meet new people and that will change, change you. Reading powerful words will change you. Loving people, losing people, hurting people, and being hurt by people, these things change us. Parenthood changes us. Getting older changes us. And so we all need to recalibrate from time to time and open ourselves up and ask, who am I now? And what's going on inside of me now? How does that change how I'm expressing my identity or values to the world? And also, this doesn't mean you have to tear your heart out every time and hold it up for all to see because that's just really exhausting. It could be that you need to pivot and add or show something that's more raw or real or you and less calculated marketing strategy that we all do in our heads all the time. Um, here's an example from the world of art. So I followed this artist. Her name is Lisa Felsen for years, and she used to post a lot of art like this. But then a while ago, she decided to make a change and she wrote this post to her followers. She said, after some soul searching, I realized I no longer want to solely curate and create my old brand anymore. 
from now on, this account will have the range and scope of artistic mischief that I get up to, not the one trick pony shit I've been making myself out to be just so the algorithm won't punish me. The relief I feel for not having to pretend in my 30s to be a person I barely was in my 20s is real. So maybe that's what this is about for you too, because your voice isn't just your voice. It's not just words. It's your character, your personality. It's an expression of who you are and what you value. So that could be art, that could be words, it could be music, it could be how you carry yourself, what you wear. I have a really dear friend who suffered a stroke several years ago that left him unable to speak. And he had been a musician and an author and a public speaker before the stroke. So it was, as you could imagine, incredibly hard for him to lose his voice. But eventually he found it again through photography. He realized that by taking photos, he could express what he was thinking and feeling inside. So he found a new voice, a new way to speak. Today, whether you're trying to find a new way to speak or just find your true voice, maybe for the first time, I know that what I'm asking you to do is absolutely hard and uncomfortable. And it can also incur real physical and emotional risk for some people, and I don't want to diminish that. For some of us, this is a lot more difficult and scary than for others. So maybe you've let that fear silence you. It would be completely understandable. The fear of how people might respond to you or how they won't. The fear of what happens next. The fear of making yourself vulnerable. The fear of looking stupid. But the question that I would ask you is, what is more oppressive than the fear or the silence? For me, there's no one in our current culture right now who represents speaking up in the face of fear more than this woman, Chanel Miller. You might remember her as Emily Doe, the woman who was raped in the dark behind a dumpster at Stanford University a few years ago. The world first heard Chanel's voice when her victim impact statement was published in 2016 and millions of people have read it. Last fall, she stepped out from the safety of anonymity and revealed her name and published a memoir called Know My Name. It's a really amazing book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, but here's what she says about her voice. She says, Brock Turner will always be the swimmer turned rapist. He was great and then he fell. Anything I do in the future will be by the victim who wrote a book. His talent precedes the tragedy. I was supposedly born in it. I did not come into existence when he harmed me. She found her voice, they say. I had a voice. He stripped it, left me groping around blind for a bit, but I always had it. I just used it like I never had to use it before. I do not owe him my success, my becoming. He did not create me. You will find society asking you for the happy ending, saying, come back when you're better, when what you say can make us feel good, when you have something more uplifting, affirming. This ugliness was something I never asked for. It was dropped on me, and for a long time, I worried that it made me ugly, too. It made me into a sad, unwelcome story that nobody wanted to hear. But when I wrote the ugly and painful parts into a statement, an incredible thing happened. The world did not plug up its ears. It opened itself to me. So I take a lot of heart and inspiration from Chanel's words because I know what it feels like to believe your story is unwelcome. And I think that a lot of you do as well. So please hear me on this. Your truth is valid no matter what happens next, no matter how your voice might falter, no matter how many tone police or gaslighters might show up in a comment section, your story is yours to tell whenever you're ready to stand up and speak. I'm here today talking to you because there's no one else on this Zoom call who can tell the story that I have to tell, just like there's no one else on this Zoom call or in this city or in this whole world even who can tell the story that you have to tell. You don't need permission to be who you are. The only person who needs to give you permission to share your story is you. So 
I'm asking you not to silence yourself. Don't let your voice be one of those lost ones because there's someone out there who needs to hear the story that lives inside of you. If you're brave enough to use your voice, you can give someone else the courage to find their own. You can inspire someone or awaken someone or make them just uncomfortable enough that they begin to question their own fears and prejudices. Your story can change the world. And maybe that sounds like a delusion of grandeur, like I've been stuck in my basement too long, like I'm shining you on, but I wanna tell you um, one last story about how the world actually changes. So at the beginning of this talk, I alluded to the fact that I've parted ways with the religion that I was born into. And just a sidebar that needs to be said, if you have a religion or faith practice that is meaningful to you, I am absolutely not advocating that you run screaming away from it. This is just part of my story. And it was a journey that took me many, many years. But I can point to one single conversation, one small seed of a story that changed my life forever. I was 21 years old and I was writing for a newspaper in Indianapolis, Indiana as part of a postgraduate journalism fellowship. It was the mid nineties. And so if you are as old as me, you remember that AIDS was a hot topic back then. So I was assigned to write a story about an AIDS patient named Jay Sprinkle. Jay was a gay man. And when I met him, he was in the hospital. I actually didn't even meet him because I was afraid to get AIDS on me. So I had been told a single story about men like Jay Sprinkle. I talked to him on the phone once for about 20 minutes. And during that conversation, Jay told me a story, his story about growing up gay in rural conservative Indiana at a time when being gay was really not okay. He had been living in Indianapolis for a few years. And one weekend he returned home to the small town he grew up in. It was a Sunday morning, so he stopped by his old church. The service had already started and he quietly made his way to a back pew and sat down. The people in front of him heard him come in, turned around and looked at him. They knew him, he had grown up there, but they turned back around without greeting him and they began to whisper to each other and he heard the word faggot. So Jay stood back up, quietly walked out, and never entered another church again for the rest of his life. It was a really painful story for him to tell. I could hear the hurt and sorrow in his voice over the line. And he didn't have to share it. I was just some punk reporter from a newspaper and I didn't need it for my story. But because he let me in and because he was brave enough to show me this raw part of himself, I suddenly saw the world differently than I had before our conversation. I saw cracks in the foundation of my worldview. I saw that this man was not the abomination that I had been taught all men like him were. In hearing a story different from the one I had heard my entire life, I saw all the possibilities in which my way of thinking might be wrong in other ways too that the world might be bigger and more mysterious and more beautiful than I realized. By telling me his story that day, Jay broke me wide open and I was never ever the same again. Your story, your voice has more power than you know. So use it, give yourself permission to speak. LaDonna, thank you so much for sharing your story with us here at Gladstone. Thank you for your time and your inspiration and your words. And um, we all look forward to getting our workbooks and working through them. So thank you. Well, cool. Thank you thank for you. sharing your story. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was great to be here with you.